Hey, I'm Angela England, and I'm here with Spencer Shaw, and today we are going to talk about how to expand your book's audience and even upsell your books, um, the readers who have purchased your book, with online events. Now, you know that I had the lesson on doing offline, in-person, and live workshops and those kinds of things. But today I'm going to talk about some of the ways that you can do things online. And I brought Spencer Shaw because he has tons of experience with courses and teaching webinars, even things like Google Hangouts. He's helped me a lot with mine. And um, I'm so excited to have him here today. Spencer, well, do you want to tell a little me. bit about your background? Yeah, sure. Um, first off, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be able to participate and answer questions and help out. Uh, my background comes from, I own a software company, so I've been doing a lot of the online pieces, um, you know, where we teach our software product. Um, and before software, I was a, an affiliate, and most people don't know, it's actually mentioned in like a book, but I, um, I worked with mixed martial artists, so guys that get in a ring and beat each other up. Um, I owned a clothing line with that, and so I had to learn how to use multimedia, you know, videos and uh, online presentations and things like that to be able to get our clothing line and get our message out there. And I've been, you know, fully immersed in that online world since about 2008, and it's it's been a pretty fun ride ever since. Yeah, I love that. So I know that having that multimedia experience can add a lot to of, of value to what you're doing. Um, one of the things that I've been discovering through this course is that just having the videos added in with the lessons has made a big difference in you know getting the students engaged and giving them options for how they want to approach something. So as an author, you know you're creating a book that somebody can sit down and read. What are the benefits of turning that into like an online course or some uh, hangouts or webinars or video trainings? Um. It gives a different experience. So, for example, we we read faster than what we can hear things. So, you know, most I think most videos are like 100 to 200 words a minute, whereas like most of us can read a lot faster than that. Mm -hmm. um, however, when you see a video, you get to really connect with someone, and you get to feel how they're communicating with their audience. And if you have graphics or if you have other types of visuals, it really lightens up the experience. So to me, that's where it's really valuable. And it it takes it from a normal to like a wow experience just by adding that video and those other pieces. I know for me, um, even as a student in college, having the, the visual and the audio at the same time helped me remember things better too. Mm -hmm. It's like if, if you have a message that you really want to get across, I like having multiple ways for people to engage with that message or that content. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, for me, like I listen to a lot of audio programs and podcasts, and, and I read a lot, but because I'm listening to the audio programs and podcasts, what's funny is like whenever I'm driving, um, I can, if I drive the same path again, I remember what they were saying in the audio. It's kind of yeah. weird. And it really, it sticks in my brain. And then especially, you know, video, you know, obviously I'm not watching video while I'm driving, but, um, you know, when I'm learning, seeing certain graphics or cues or a way that a person's presenting helps. And I see oftentimes that people don't do it because they're scared that, it usually really comes down to they're scared to looking dumb or yeah. not, not looking professional. And, yes, my first videos that I did years ago were awful. Like they were, they were cringeworthy. Like the sound quality is bad, the video quality is bad, the ums and ahs, and and I was awkward. And you just have to get to a point and say, you know what? Like it doesn't matter. Like I'm just going to put it out there, and it's building that muscle. It's kind of like writing. Like you're not going to say, oh, I want to write a book, and then day one, like you write the most incredible book on your first day. <laughs> yeah. Like you. You have to show up and work, and by the end, like you actually have something good. And same thing with videos. Yeah, I think that's so true. I showed the students in one of the lessons my first ebook cover, and I'm not sure I sent it to you. I, I made I've it I've seen in it. Pink. Yeah. Oh yes, I did send oh, it to you. It. It's so bad. Like I don't think that with today's technology, they could make a video 
first video worse than my first ebook cover. So I, I think they're good. <laughs> you you won an award for that. Yeah, I mean, uh, worst start ever. Yeah. And I, I think the same goes for Hangouts or the same goes for webinars. I mean, like, take Hangouts for an example. It's, it's fairly new, and it's actually acceptable to look low-tech, you know what I mean? Yeah. To, like, be wearing a headset or to have audio issues because you're connecting with someone. And... Granted, like, I did a hangout last night, and I do, like, corporate hangouts. And, you know, we had a lot of people on, and we, like, ran serious graphics, and, like, there was a film before and after. But I didn't start that way. Like, it took yeah. me so much work to get to that level, and so it's just getting in. What are some of the options for somebody who wants to take their book and that, that message that's in their book, and develop some online products or trainings. Um, I mean, what are the different options there? Okay, so... Talk about Hangouts. What are some others? Um, I think Hangouts is one of the easiest, and especially with the new features, you can make them public or private. I think the biggest thing to realize is if you are writing and you're creating content, eventually you're going to create an audience. Right. And if you create an audience, what happens is those people begin to, you know, the typical marketing, know, like, and trust you. And so if you come out with something on top of your book, you know, additional material, if they know, like, and trust you and what you have is good, they're going to want to buy it. And so doing the Hangout, it could be something where you're, you know, additional training. It could be private or public. Um, your videos. One of the things that is great is Eventbrite. Uh, that's a website that holds local events, but they also do online events. Ah. And so, and they take care of all the payment processing. So we've done hangout events where we run it through Eventbrite, and we display the event and the time, and people have to pay for it. And so that's a way. And people, again, if they know, like, and trust you, and you have a good product, they'll pay right. you for it. Um, other things that we've done are webinars. Now, getting into actual webinars, there's a higher cost to it because of the webinar platform. Right. But webinars are incredible for getting your message out there, um, and you could probably get on it. You know, find a free account. Um, you know, I'm trying to. Yeah, think. I know. Even Instant Teleseminar have like a 21 day free trial. Yeah. So if you were trying a paid a paid webinar, you could try it <laughs> during that 21 days and then hopefully earn enough then to continue the, the monthly. Yeah, I, th I think the big thing is um, you're not being afraid to charge for additional material. You know, um, you know, you, you wrote a book about um, was on an acre or uh, Back, more or less. Backyard farming, mm -hmm. yep. So, um, you know, if someone is really serious about backyard farming and they want to get additional material that's deeper than what the book takes them, mm -hmm. they're going to be willing to pay for it. And right. you'll have to judge of what that price is. You know, is that price going to be $500? Probably not. But, um, you know, $25, bucks, $50, bucks, $100 to, to learn, like, here's the checklist, here's the additional material, and here's a question and answer. Yeah, any day a person's going to do that because it's valuable and if they know, like, and trust you. Right, because they've already built up that relationship with you through reading your book or um, being on your newsletter. One of the things that I talked about um, just a couple lessons ago was, you know, building up your newsletter list and, and making a free subscription thing for the your newsletter. And um, once you start building that up, you're even in their inbox every week. They don't even have to, you know, hunt you down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're, you've got that connection. Yeah, and so, so speaking of, like, the inbox, um, if you go into deciding to do multimedia, video especially YouTube is incredibly powerful because you get inside of the YouTube subscription inbox. So once mm -hmm. you subscribe to a channel, it updates them and lets them know here's a new video. Ah. So that's where it's really valuable. Um, you know, I've got one channel that, I mean, we've got like over 70,000 views on the channel. I mean, that's not a ton, but because we've got so many views, 
you know, when we put out a new video, we automatically get views on the right. new videos. And, you know, I'm not going to use the word viral, but, you know, it, some people do share it, and, and it helps add more and more people to it. Right. It builds up your audience kind of organically um, mm -hmm. because the people who are already really rabid fans, now they're talking about it, and you're giving them something new to talk about. Um, and I think for me, that's one of the things um, I, I think that some authors don't necessarily realize is that you can write a book, but you're going to connect with you know this audience with that mm -hmm. particular book. If you put out something new, then you could connect with this audience over here because you're giving it a slightly different focus and, and you're using YouTube instead of a bookstore. And so you're going to tap into a potential audience that spends more time on YouTube than a bookstore. And now you're reaching them and they're going to say, oh, they've also written a book. And you're going to, you get a cross promotion um, effort that I think people don't necessarily realize the value of that, having mm -hmm. the different types of marketing effects, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, you know, I, I oftentimes hear people, they'll ask, they'll say, okay, well, you do a lot of videos, you do a lot of hangouts, you do a lot of webinars. Tell me the tactics. Like, how long should my videos be? Mm -hmm. How should I structure them? And the truth is that there's no blanket rule to it. Um, because what really, you know, what really matters is engaging content and keeping people interested. And, you know, a perfect example is I'm subscribed personally, you know, one of my interests. I love survival and prepper stuff. I It's just one of the things I like. This now, is why we're friends. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you watch the survival and prepper videos that most of the people do, they are, traditionally speaking, the most boring videos you will ever watch. Their camera skills are awful. Most of the time, they don't, they're don't. they actually not even on camera. Like, they're too weird. Like, they're, they're scared that... NSA is going to find them, so they won't even be on camera. And they'll just be showing stuff. And but their videos will be like 15 minutes long, and they'll be describing how to create, a, you know, a, a box garden or how to create a gasifier, or weird things like that. And I will stay hooked the whole time. Whereas, <laughs> whereas, like, there could be a video that is super polished and it's two minutes long, and 30 seconds into it, I'm out. Right. Sometimes I think, you know, the over-polished stuff comes across more as a commercial instead of a, a personal chat, like we're having, you know, just mm -hmm. kind of a fun hangout. I've got my coffee. We're sitting in the living room. It's, you know, it's more casual and down to earth, and I think that that personal connection can draw people in a lot more than something that comes across like a sales yeah, pitch. Absolutely. I mean, I run, a, I run a podcast, and I spent the longest time trying to make my podcast as polished and perfect as possible. And what it did, and, and don't get me wrong, like the quality did go up, but my stress level and workload <sighs> yeah. was it was so incredibly high. And I really I realized that to make it the professional you know output was the twenty percent of the result. But it was that that was that required eighty percent of my efforts. And you know go back to the 80-20 rule. And so you know, in your marketing, or your, if you want to, if you built that brand, or if you're thinking, that, here's a big thing to think about. If you're thinking of writing a book, or you're still in the early stages of writing a book, a really good thing to do is get feedback. Now, I don't mean feedback in the sense of what should I, you know, like you, you were talking with me about the course. You said um, someone gave you feedback that, that totally threw you off track. Yes. So you don't need to get feedback of maybe like the pieces to the course, but you want to get feedback of how are you receiving this? What are your, um, like how are you thinking about it? Psychological things, like what questions do you have? And then that helps you move it forward, you know? That's, right. the, type of, that's the type of good feedback to get. And you can get that through video, through webinars, through hangouts, things like that. Yeah, I, I, I love tapping into um, an audience for small questions or um, general broad things. One of the things that I'm doing with Backyard Farming is I'm going to develop a course specifically on edible landscaping. 
because that is something that I got a lot of feedback about, that particular section. It was a small section in the book, but I've actually developed it into a um, workshop I just taught down here at the local uh, garden show for the county, and they had me come to the Master Gardener like fall program and do the edible landscaping speech. And so when I kind of asked my audience, like, what are the things, like, what would you like to see more of? That was one of the topics that came up immediately, and I thought, aha, I, I have so much more to say about this than I was able to fit into that book because of the editorial and page constraints and stuff. Um, and so that that was exactly, I mean, I think that's a great example of, like, what what are you interested in more of? Mm -hmm. And, you know, my backyard farming audience, they wanted more information about that really small-scale, you know, edible landscaping, sneaking it in under the nose of your homeowners association. <laughs> so it kind of blends in with the rest of the neighborhood, but you're like, I call it gardening like a ninja. There you're you go. Because you in those edible stuff. Um, so that's definitely a, a, you know, a workshop that's on my mind to do. Um, I've done it in person now. I just have to translate that to the, the online stuff and develop more uh, this spring. So. Yeah, I mean, that's so valuable because uh, even if you don't create an additional course, if you create a video or training, it's right. going to help sell your book. Well, exactly. And, you know, it, it was one of those things like that wasn't the section that I would have immediately thought to expand on because in my mind, my audience was more rurally based, mm -hmm. but it surprised me how many people bought my book that live right in city limits, which of course I do too. So they really connected with the fact that, you know, finding that out, just asking my audience gave me the chance to find that out that I had no clue of until I took the time to ask. So I really like that um, point that you made. Yeah. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think, like, the big thing is just consistency. Like, and, and overcoming the fear of looking dumb. Like, it, you know, you can, I, you know, it's funny. When I have, a, like, a tech problem, I typically go to YouTube as my first place to solve my tech problem. So I, I skip Google. I actually just go to YouTube because I'm a visual person. Right. And one of the most interesting things is, so if you ever have a tech problem, you or your listeners, use YouTube to find the solution. Gee, I go straight but, to you. Okay, <laughs> yeah, no, okay. <laughs> but here's the thing that that just boggles my mind. Most of the people that are showing me how to solve the tech problems are like 13 year old kids from the UK, <laughs> and like they're on their screen capture, and they're like, "Hi, so I'm gonna show you how to do," and like they're helping me, and like it's because they're not scared about looking down. Right. And the same thing could be for authors. Like, there's so much knowledge you have, and if you just say, "Okay, you know what? I'm gonna do a video about this one thing," or "I'm gonna do a hangout about this one thing," then it just continues to grow. Right. And I mean, you know, you have to ask yourself, what's the worst that can happen? You make an awful video, and it gives you something to show people five years down the road when you're this awesome like hangout expert, and you're <laughs> teaching them a course. You can be like. Let me show you when I first started. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it just takes it just takes getting in there, um, and getting your hands dirty and doing it. So um, for somebody who's never done any video or anything at all, and they're literally like, "Oh my gosh, I don't even know where to start." What would be your top tips to get started? Okay, um, my my number my top tips would be this. Take your webcam, if you have a webcam on your laptop, mm -hmm. go into YouTube, and where your upload settings are, there's this thing that says record with web webcam. So click that and just record a live video. And plan it out. So if you're going to talk about um, you know, sneaking in edibles within your you know, front yard, right. then you know, I would probably say, um, hey, I'm going to share with you the the five best plants that are easy, you know, five plants that you could put in your front yard, and just share it, like on camera, or you know, use your phone and sideways. Use the yes, sideways. <laughs> don't use, don't do it that way. Do it this way, um, and shoot a video. And if you are completely afraid of having your face on camera then use a screen capture tool 
and just screen capture. It could even be like a PowerPoint presentation, it could be a Word document, or it could be uh, slides of pictures. And just do the quick and dirty. Like, get it done, don't overthink it, and then put it out there. Right. And, and you'll be surprised at how well it actually will do if, if, you, if you do it. Right. My husband plays basketball, and uh, that's his favorite sport, you know, from high school and everything. And he always says, "You you miss 100% of the baskets of the shots you don't take." Mm -hmm. So I I kind of like that philosophy. He's encouraged me a lot through the years with that. You just you have to take the shot in order to make the shot. Yeah, I mean, I think the lowest barrier of entry is is probably a screen capture thing, because your face isn't on camera. Um, yeah, I just said, um, did you say that? Um, I heard you. And I did it You're again. Fired. So I know. I do it all the time. And the thing is, like, people want someone that's real. Yeah. And they want to be able to connect. So if you just do it, then over time, people, they're, they're connecting to, to you. And so they're going to forget about the ums and the ahs and how polished it is. They care about who you are and what you're teaching them. Right, and especially when you're you're sharing something that you feel passionate about, mm -hmm. you know, that that um, motivation, that encouragement that you have for them or the new skill that you're teaching them, that's going to be more important than the quality of the lighting in this room. So, you know, I I know it's not perfect, but if it's going to be helpful. So I'm willing to look a little yellow and help someone out. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, tactically, you know, to give, to give a plan of how to create the best video. So one, whatever your niche is or whatever your, you know, your expert status is, find something that you can concisely teach. So, mm -hmm. you know, for example, in your book, you picked that one thing about the the edibles, you know, things that you can have in your yard, front yard. Right. Um, then drill it down, something that can be uh, helping them, and then it goes back to the basic speaking formula, which is, you know, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Right. You know, very simple like that. And when you are deciding on what your video should be, it's going through and looking at other videos and saying, okay, this is maybe the keywords or the way I should word the video. People like, uh, here's a video tip that really helps out. So if you're doing a YouTube video, if you do the words how to and then fill in the blank, right. that's very valuable because people are, on YouTube at least, it's becoming the search engine to solving problems, whereas like Facebook is not solving problems. Facebook is a disruption service. And I'm not saying that derogatory, but it's like right. it's a shock and awe. Whereas YouTube is, I have a problem, I want it solved. If you solve it, like for me, uh, I'll give you a perfect example. I love I'm starting to love filmmaking. I'm learning about it. I'm an awful filmmaker. I'm an awful video editor, but I'm learning. It's taking time. Uh, but I'm subscribing, when I go onto YouTube, I'll be like, how to do Ken Burns photo uh, editing in Final Cut Pro. And if I find a really good tutorial, I'll click subscribe. And I'll even click subscribe before the video's done. Nice. So, because I'm That's like... interesting. Yeah, because then I'm like, you know what? This person took the time to share it, even if it's like a 12-year-old kid. Like, I'm like, cool, they get their stuff. And now it's almost like a bookmark. I'm like, okay, now I can go back to them. Whenever I have a question about Final Cut, that's my source. And then when their new video comes out, I'm like, oh, that's really cool. So it's been you know, very helpful for me. So it's just getting it out there. I like that. And I like um, you know, what you said about making it a concise point for each video because I think sometimes we get this like, oh, my gosh, I have to teach a, a documentary on edible landscaping and how am I going to think of an hour and not mess it up? But, you know, with, like what you were saying, here's five plants. Here's, you know, yeah. blah, blah. And one of the tips that I had given for creating guest posts and brainstorming guest post ideas was to look at the sidebars 
And those sidebars are usually like little lists or little like tip, little snippets of information that didn't necessarily weave within the chapter, but were still valuable to the book. And a lot of times, it, it seems to me like those would be the perfect kinds of things to start translating into video. Um, mm -hmm. Just like they make really good guest posts because you can just pull that sidebar, you know, 10 plants you can grow in the shade was the example I used. It turned into this amazing guest post for somebody. It's been shared just a bajillion times. And, you know, it's, it's drawn exactly right from the book. And I just took that list of 10 plants and described each one. And boom, I had this great guest post for a magazine site. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that would make a great video too. Mm -hmm. a, a cheap way of... I don't mean cheap. Um, what do I say? A tactical way of getting traffic to your website, and I've done this for years, is if you're scared to do a video and you're like, oh, I, I know I should do one, I'm scared to do it, I don't know what to talk about, is to go through and be the curator. So go on YouTube, find the videos that people would be interested in, feature that video on your website, on your blog. Mm-hmm write up about it, or do a screen capture and say, hey, I have this challenge, here are the videos that I found, and then let the video, you know, the person that has the video on YouTube know, there's a good chance that they're going to, in, to uh, link up to your blog, and now you're going to get different traffic. Um, so it's, it's piecing everything together. So even if you are question, questioning if you're an expert, you know, news reporters, News anchors on TV are not experts, but everyone thinks they are, but they're just reading a teleprompter. They're only perceived experts because they're curating information. Right. Like, they, they don't, they're not experts at all. Like, they're experts at reading a machine. That's it. So. That, and connecting, and connecting with people when there's a question on something, you know, they're, they're connecting to get this person's opinion on something. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I like that idea. And, you know, most of most of the authors in this group now have a website because that was a lesson I discussed with them a little while back. Yeah. So they should all have websites by now with, you know, landing pages and things like that. So this is a great way then if they're not quite to the point of adding a multimedia thing themselves, they can tap into what other people are doing to bring that experience to their to their audience. So I like that idea too. Awesome. That's definitely the, the lowest barrier to entry, for yeah. sure, like, steal someone else's video. <laughs> yeah. I mean, do it in a cool way, feature the video. Um, you can do, like, video responses to people. It's not as effective as it used to be. Um, it used to be really good for what we call, like, traffic siphoning. Mm. So, because, you know, because I came from owning the clothing line and uh, mixed martial arts, like, the health industry is very competitive, and so we had to be very hyperactive. And so we used to, you know, could do a, a, co a video comment, a video response, and then we'd get a lot of traffic off of that. Um, but nowadays it's just, it's, it's being as simple as possible and being as real as possible. Yeah, I think I it really, it, it well, no, you know, it's the thing that I've been saying this whole time. It's, you know, it's having a strong message, something that's worth sharing. And then sharing it in a way that isn't going to turn people off. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we talked about you, you need to edit your writing before you put it out there, have someone else look at it. But you also don't have to, like, spend $10,000 and, and hire multiple, you know, whatever. Just, you know, have somebody who knows what they're doing, look it over. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that's, it's the same thing for video. You know, have a strong message and then put it out there as best as you can at this time. Yeah. And people are going to respond well to that, I think. And, um, especially when you are sharing something that you feel strongly about and that, you know, is going to encourage people or whatever. Um, I, I, like, I like getting started and just doing it and learning as you go. I think that that is really underestimated <laughs> by grown-ups. We do that with our kids. We're like, oh, yay, you took a step, and then you fell flat on your face. Good job, honey. Yeah. And, you know, it's like at what point does it stop being okay to trip and stumble a little bit? Like, you know, once we're grown-ups, we, we kind of, we forget that that's how we learned everything else that we've ever done in life. Mm -hmm. It's all up here. Um, so let me share a few things for people that have already done videos or maybe they're intermediate or advanced or they're like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm ready to do it and I'm going to go big. 
All right. Um, okay, so one, lighting. Lighting is huge. Um, so I'm going to show you. I'm going to grab my webcam. Okay, because it's that, the part that I'm I'm not 100% on okay. yet. That's, uh, oh. that's one of my lights. I have so a light is that, here. Is that like a photography light with a diffuser over it? Is that mm -hmm. Yeah, it's called a softbox. Um, I bought it on Amazon. I think it was $189. You can get one that's much cheaper. Okay. Um, you can I've actually seen, do... I was going to say, I've seen tutorials for making your own for photography. Would that same concept work? Yes. For so, video? So the one, the cheapest light that you can use is free. It's called the right. sun. It's awesome. <laughs> um, the way you do it is you open up your window. So go where there's a lot of light and have the camera. So you are facing the window. The camera's in the window, and it's facing you. Sunlight hits you. That's the very best. Uh, if you're doing videos outside, the very best time of day to do a video is one hour before the sunset and the first hour after sunrise. Those are the two best times. It's that is called so the, early. <laughs> I love it. Like I'm an early person, so like when I I used to live on the beach, and that's where I did a ton of my videos, and I love it. But that's uh, it's called the golden hour. Right. If you can't make that, use sunlight, have it hit you. Now, if you're going to invest in lights, the cheapest is you can buy a clamp light from like Home Depot. They're about, uh, call about 10 bucks, And put a daylight bulb, so you want the term daylight. Okay. Uh, that way, a daylight bulb is not yellow. So right, it that's looks the normal. problem that I'm having. Correct, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. you want a clamp light with daylight bulb, get a bright, bright bulb, and then you want to put a diffuser paper over it, and you can just use you can use a uh, like a clothesline. So just clothesline a daylight bulb to it. You're done, and probably get a good two or three, and then just put them. You know, say here's my face. Uh, you want them to be probably about two to three feet away from you, and then. You can have it so that that's a soft light on your face. And then your camera will be, you know, a couple feet back. Right. Now, that's the lighting. Lighting is really big. And as far as your other piece that's super important is your audio. And audio is actually more important than video. And so if you ever watch a movie and... Um, it has bad audio, it, something feels off. Mm -hmm. But, and, and audio is like, audio is that thing where you don't recognize that it's good, but you recognize when it's bad. Right. Um, so I've got this microphone right here. It's actually on a boom. It's called a blue snowball. You can get them for 50 bucks, maybe, if that. It works great. I could use the audio on my camera if I wanted. It wouldn't sound as good. If you're using a microphone, so like a using a video camera or even a uh, iPhone, there's a microphone by uh, Amazon or no by Audio Technica. You can get it on Amazon. It's called a lavalier mic. It's a wired mic. It's less than twenty dollars. I use them for my videos and they sound awesome. So I'm talking like twenty bucks. That's all it's going to cost. Yeah, I've heard of those. Uh, mm -hmm. They're on my wish list. They're awesome. Right now I'm and using earbuds. That works. That works too. Um, and uh, another tip, if you have to use earbuds, you can actually take this and you could just kind of wrap it in your shirt, like right here. And if you have two iPhones or if you have a video camera, you can, because this has a microphone built in, you can put it in your shirt and have it record the audio and then have another camera record your face if you're, you know, 100 feet away or 20 feet away from the camera. So ah. it's a geeky tip. Um, and then the next is the camera itself. I use a webcam. It's called a Logitech C920. Mm -hmm. so I think it's about 70 or 80 bucks. If you have a, most laptops and computers now have really good webcams built into them, just use that. And Honestly, for my video, even when I shoot like on a green screen 
or white screen or like what looks very professional, iPhone. I'm always shooting with an iPhone. Uh, I use an app called Filmic Pro, F-I-L-M-I-C Pro. Okay. And it is a totally professional app. It is incredible. You can lock exposure, lock white balance, um, and you'll look like a complete rock star with it. <laughs> so I'm getting it. You sold it's, me. It's awesome. So a couple bucks. I mean, so those are the, the ways to step it up a little bit more. And then as far as editing your video, YouTube has an in-video, mm -hmm. like they have a, a video editor built in. So, right. you know, if for the first 10 seconds, if you're moving around and trying to get ready, just upload it to YouTube, cut it off. If you want to step it up, you can use a video editor on your computer program. And the better you get at uh, editing, it just takes a little bit of time. And, you know, you'll learn how to chop things. You'll learn how to, you know, edit uh, or add music or other things like that. When I have a video on my iPhone that I want uh -huh. to edit, I do it right in iMovie. Okay. You can, cut, you can cut out or add photos in um, with the video itself if, you, if that's what you're wanting to do. So um, I've used that one, and I think it's free with the iPhone. Okay, I say I've never used it, so, um, but that's cool. You can, you can add their licensed music in with it, and whatever. Yeah, I that's a, some, like photo slide things for different events or whatever. Yeah, I would just you, you know use the use the tools that you have. I mean, I, I obviously I've geeked out a lot, so I use a program <laughs> called Final Cut Pro, um, right. and you know I have some other a bunch of other like mixing boards and other geeky things like that. But it's because it's a it's a hobby. It's something I really enjoy. Um, right. Yeah, and I think that's like anything. You know, once you once you get comfortable with a basic level, then you, you do start kind of growing. I mean, I've done that with my blog. It's like when I started, I was on blogspot.com, and now I'm on a premium custom theme that I redesigned myself and <laughs> gone crazy with the plugins and you know whatever. So I, I think that's how it is with anything. As you start learning more and more, you kind of you take you push yourself to that next level. Yeah, but it, but it doesn't start out with the premium. And I think when people when people start out with the premium, um, it can almost be more of a crutch because they're relying on the tools. And it's like, um, you know, if you look at a person, if they're learning to golf, they're they're going to play horribly, regardless if they're on a pair of a hundred dollar clubs or if they're on a pair of two thousand dollar clubs. The right. thing is, is, is just getting out and swinging, and it's just like video. Maybe, maybe your swing time is limited to five videos, and you're like, you know what? I really, I got this. Um, and the other thing is, like, the word viral, it ain't gonna happen. It, it just, it is not. Um, but what I mean is, there's a chance that you you can create videos if you've got good videos. Like I've got videos that have you know 10,000 views, because they address a problem. Like, right. it would be a problem and my video is solving it. And it didn't go viral, but that's a lot of views. And and it's it's views from people who, they're not coming to you for the entertainment, the 30 mm -hmm. second uh, and forget about you thing. I mean, how often have we watched a stupid viral video and then, you know, two months later it had zero impact on our life. We don't even think about it, talk about it, or it does, we don't care about it. Whereas with a video that solves a problem, when we create something that is giving people a solution to a problem that they're solving, whether it's a book or a video or whatever medium it's in, that is something that's making an impact on their life. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, probably one of the, the best tips that I can give for once you've taken your product or your thing, you know, your book, you've written your book, you've become the expert. You may think that you're the expert, or you may not. Regardless, you are. Once you've written something, you know more than other people. And now you say, I want to teach more. I want to do another class. And what I do, how I create additional training in my business, my software business, and our publishing, what I do is this. I go through and I say, OK, well, and I'm going to use podcasting as an example. Okay. I say, I've posted on Facebook within groups, and I get interest with it. And I've mentioned our podcast to parts of our email subscribers, and I get interest there. 
Okay, so I think that they would be interested in a course, but I don't want to invest all the time that it takes to create an enormous course because it, it really does. I mean, you're creating yours. You're telling it's me. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Like It is. And people don't realize how much because you've got to plan it. You've got to structure everything, record it, edit it. Uh, uh, you know, editing itself is huge and then wrap everything together and then put it, you know, there's a lot of work to it. And the challenge is, is most of the time people do this, if I build it, they will come. And you have to look at it and say, you know, um, my work is a circle and I need to close the feedback cycle as fast as possible. Because the worst thing, one of the worst things that can happen is if you invest 50 hours in a project of creating a really good course to supplement your book, and then you release it and no one wants it. Mm -hmm. Even though it's yeah. great, it doesn't provide value. It, it took 50 hours. And so what I do is I'll go through, I've tested the waters a little bit, then I'll create a small training video or something that provides value. Like, that gives them a lot of action steps, a lot of value, a lot of know-how information. And then I say, what I'm going to do is hold a live training and we're going to cover, you know, list out the things that you're going to cover and charge for it. And what happens is people will pay to show up and during that live training, A, you're forced to create content for the live training. B, you get to train people and go further with it, C, you're getting paid, D, you're getting feedback, E, you're getting testimonials. All of those things happen at once. And then, once I've done that, I now, you know, I've forced, I created a product, they paid me, which means feedback is people want it, and now I can say, okay, what was the part that I should have taught more? What was the part I should have taken out? Mm -hmm. And now you can go through and create the full course, but people paid you to create the course. So that's where it's really valuable. That's smart. Yeah, I, I kind of skipped that stuff. <laughs> but, uh, most people, I did for years and years and years. I mean, I created so many courses, and, um, you know, some courses would sell, I'd sell like $500 worth, and some courses would sell $50,000 worth. And had I been smarter than, uh, than I was, you know, had, had I followed that process all the time, it would have condensed my feedback loop like crazy. Yeah, now I will say that I actually did a publishing class mm -hmm. um, at, as a live event that I got paid to speak at. So um, I would say that that kind of took the place or served as that because one of the things that I did, it was on three ways to achieve your publishing dreams. And so I talked about creating the traditional like PDF download ebook, um, traditional print, which I've published two books now through a traditional publishing house, and then self-publishing, which I've also done. And so that whole, that hour-long workshop was, you know, the overviews of how to get started, the pros and cons, kind of comparing and contrasting all of the different methods, and then an action step for success on how to get started and best tips for success in each of those three areas. And the, the feedback that I got from that the most questions that I had had to do with the self-publishing aspect and that's actually what made me decide to do this course because I had so many people come up and say you know this is the year that I want to self-publish a book and um, I really liked that part of your talk but how can I do more or how can I get started or you know I don't understand this aspect of it so that's actually what um, in large part prompted me to go through and, and do this so in a sense that live event served as kind of that that feet testing ground um, before I before I invested in yeah. the time. That, that's critical, the testing ground. And you got paid to do it. Um, right. And, and that's a big thing. Like, um, A, go out and, like, have, you know, people should go out and provide value. And there's, it's good to create free content or, you know, just creating content. One, because it, it causes your muscle to work, which is good. And it, it, helps establish your relationship and your status. So that's good. But the truth is, until you charge people, then that's where, that's where you find reality. Because any day a person can sign up for a free email newsletter. Or any day um, 
you know, a person can be like, oh yeah, I'm totally into this. But when there's an actual like money exchanging, and it doesn't even have to be much. I mean, it could be like, it could be five dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars. Um, but when there's money exchanging, then it turns real, and then it's like, okay, I got real people that are into this, and right. now and you've got they've... real feedback. They've put money on the table to sit and listen to what you have to say. So that mm -hmm. means you have to you have to deliver something that's yes. worth listening to. Yep. Yeah. Even if it again, even if it's not much, even if it's you know ten dollars a head or something like that, you're like, wow, I got paid for this. And hey, you know what? That ten dollars could go towards graphics, you know, or that ten dollars could mm -hmm. go whatever, you know, towards other things, other projects. It, it's just um, it's critical getting the actual feedback of money that's that's a big thing and I'm not trying to make it all about money but that is like the real feedback any day a person can sign up for free but when you're like hey you know check out through PayPal or Eventbrite it's like okay I, I'm gonna be serious or not right and and you're gonna have a more engaged audience then mm -hmm. I mean it's like what we were talking about before uh, we hit record you know it, it's not uncommon to you know like I have the free newsletter subscription download and I would say about 5% of the people who subscribe to the newsletter never actually go download the book that they subscribed to get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like this free book, you know, subscribe and you get this free book. And, you know, it's, it's a nice little book to find the site and the site philosophy. But, um, you know, not everybody who gets it is, is going to actually download it and actually read it. And that, that happens. But, you know, if you're charging for something, they're a lot more likely to show up because they put they money are. down. So. Well, it's, it's just like, uh, uh, you know, when you publish an Amazon book, if you put it up for free, the, you know, well, you know, who knows how many people are open. You know, I don't know what your open rates would be of people actually reading the book. But if you pay $1.99, $2.99 for a book, like the likelihood of actual reading the book is a lot higher. Right. Because because there's money invested. Yeah, even if it's less than this cup of coffee, you're still you're like, oh, I paid for that. You know, yeah. I need to read it. Mm -hmm. I yeah, think it, I think you're right. It does make a difference. And from a, from a teacher perspective, I know I'm not going to just show up and wing it because I know that people have made a point. You know, they pulled out their credit cards for this, so mm -hmm. I need to make sure that I'm delivering. And yeah. I'm I'm going to treat it just that much more seriously and make sure I look my notes over before I. I to start, you know, I, I think that it changes the mindset on both sides of, of the computer screen. So. Yeah, it, it also, it does something to the ego of self, and maybe it's, maybe it's just because I have a fragile ego, I don't know, but it's like, <laughs> um, but it just feels good to know that, like, you know what, like, people are paying to hear information that I have. Wow, this, like, this feels really, like, I'm honored to be able to teach it. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, if it's just free, it's like attaboys, like, oh, great job, oh, I'm going to share this, or oh, thanks. And, like, that's nice, but, like, I'm honored. I'm like, wow, like, and, I, and I'm, I'm weird like this. This is where I'm weird. When I, I'll think about a course, like, let's say it's a $20 course, okay? And I'll, I'll connect with my buyers many times. Like, I'll, hey, thanks for buying it, or whatever. Um, and I like to learn about who they are and say it's a worker. So let's say it's someone that works at Walmart, for example, okay? Because Walmart's always in the news for working. And they're um, a cashier. And we'll say they make 10 bucks an hour. And I have no clue how much a cashier makes. But we'll just say that. Um, that's 20 bucks. That'd be $20 gross. And if your course is $20, then in my mind I go, wow, this person just gave me two and a half hours of their life because that's how much it's going to take for them to pay for this course. And that I'm really honored. Like I, even on small prod, like small prices and small products, I'm honored because I'm like, you know what? Like that's how much of their life they they had to work to pay for this. Right. And so I'm going to do everything that I can to create the very best product so that it, helps them and, you know, whatever that benefit that they're looking for, I help them get closer to that benefit. 
I, I love connecting with my readers. Um, and one of the things that I talked about in a lesson that I don't think I've talked to you about yet is having a survey in my newsletter subscription loop. So when someone subscribes, that first email, it's like, oh, I'd love to find out more about you. And I get hundreds and hundreds of responses through that survey. And it's so cool to read. Like, I love checking that. I, I probably check that more than I check my analytics. Because, you know, these people are telling me, like, what they're into, what they're interested in, what they're struggling with, what the hardest thing is for them right now. And um, not only does it give me a great insight into, you know, future content, things that I can be doing to serve my readers, but it's also just really cool to see who these people are and, you know, all the things that they have going on. They took time out of their day to connect with me. That's, mm -hmm. that's really cool. It, it's an awesome, it's an awesome thing to see. So. Absolutely. I can relate to that feeling. Yeah, you know, I, I, I when you said that, I, I immediately thought of uh, one of my customers. He's been a customer for two and a half years now. His name is Lindley. He's from South Africa, and I love the guy. He's awesome. And like we have conversations. He's a musician as well. And cool. you know, you can tell if the guitar's behind me. I'm a musician. Thank um, you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you come from a musical, you know, you, music background. Um, and I love it because I get to connect with him on so many levels. And I mean, last night we were chatting in Facebook together. Like, yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's beyond just the typical, um, I'm an expert and you can't touch me. I'm so much better. Like, that's where writing books and creating videos, it's like you develop more friendships, and I know it sounds so like touchy-feely, woo-woo-woo, and all that, but I don't know, that's where it's fun. Well, I agree, and I think I think that that's one of the cool things about doing something like this with the, with the course is, you know, it's not just a one-time transaction. They're not just downloading my $12 ebook and then I never hear from them again. These are people that now they've been through, you know, at this point probably 25 lessons with me, and they're leaving comments, and we're connecting, and we're doing some phone calls and things and so to me that that makes a huge difference and I you can tell I'm, I'm not a shy person so I like to connect with people uh, to me that's half the, the fun of it yeah it's I don't, it's a fun thing I mean I don't know where uh, where the listeners or members or I don't know what you're calling them I don't know where they are in their their cycle of publishing um, but I remember where where I was in my cycle of publishing my first book. And it's scary because the inadequate feelings of like, I'm never going to be a good enough writer. Oh, and I'm never going to be perceived as an expert. Or do I, do I even really know enough to be an expert? Or, you know, and like all those questions. And I remember going to you and asking certain technical questions like, oh, wow, like, how should I get this edited, or how should this be formatted, or um, you know, you would know, give we, me insights. We talked a lot about links, even like what to what links you could include in a book, and yeah, and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, and it, you help me out with that, and and it comes to a point where you say, you know what, like I'm just going to share it. I'm going to do it, and the truth is, like it will probably as weird as it sounds. It'll probably never feel good enough, but it, you it just never show does. Yeah. It, it never does. And one of the things that I, I shared with the students earlier in the course, like backyard farming, was my first print book. Okay, it went through multiple layers of editing because I had a tech editor, as well as two and sometimes three editors in house with a traditional, like with a professional publishing house, and there was still you know, things that slip through the cracks, and that just happens. But the fact that there's a problem in the table of contents, and part three is listed twice, and part two is nowhere to be found, <laughs> does not negate the fact that this book changes people's lives, and that yep. this book can help empower people to move forward with this amazing journey that they've decided to tackle of, you know, being more self-sufficient. And at whatever level they're able to achieve, I'm able to help them achieve yep. that. And that when you can get to the place where you can say, I don't know everything, but here's what I do know, and this can help you, that is uh, an amazing feeling of just, you know, it, it's kind of a confidence and humility at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything, but, you know, I've, I've 
I've got this part figured out and here's some things to consider. And that right there can help people. And, and you know, it's just being willing to push publish. Yeah, <laughs> you it know, really is. Just, just being willing to say, okay, this is really scary right now. And I remember um, the week that my book was launching and all of a sudden it hit me like, oh my gosh, this is real. And I hadn't seen a print copy of it yet. And um, and I just, I one day at the dinner table, I was like, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> and my husband said, what do you mean? And I was like, if people are going to pay money to read this book. What was I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> and my kids, bless their honest little hearts, my five-year-old, he was four at the time, he looked at me and he said, but mom, you're so good at talking all the time and telling people what to do. And I was like, she thinks, honey. Yeah. <laughs> you know, find find those really honest and encouraging people in your life. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think it goes to the people that aren't um, encouraging, the trolls, the mm. negative feedback. And something I always think of is, you know, film critics? Film critics go out and they're like, well, I give this video a three out of five, and they give their feedback. Well, yes. When was the last time that a film critic made a movie? Never. <laughs> they, they're they good at at giving their opinion, but they're not good at actually creating. Yeah. And then that's where, you know, you have to look at it differently and say, you know what, like, it, it, it's almost to that point where, like, you don't realize what you're doing until you hit publish, and you're like, oh, I'm going to get feedback. Whoa, there this, there like, is this moment, yeah. This became real. And it's like, if you can get to that point where you hit publish and it's live before you would, like realize it's real, then it's like, oh, it's real, it's to the world. Okay, well, cool. Whatever, you know, whatever happens, happens. Yes, and, and sometimes you really do. Like, I remember just stepping away and saying, it's up, it's live. Like, people are buying it and they're emailing me about it and I can't even look right now. Like, and I just, I had to call a friend that I knew got me. And I think this is what's really important for people when they're seeking feedback in that vulnerable stage. Mm -hmm. um, not the kind of feedback you were talking about earlier, like, hey guys, what you know aspect are you struggling with the most? Like that's more cerebral. But mm -hmm. when you're in that vulnerable point, you need to find somebody who understands you and gets your vision and what you're about and just say, like, I'm feeling really vulnerable right now because People are emailing me about my book and I'm scared to look. And when you're honest like that with somebody who loves you, what Brene Brown calls the, the friends who will help you bury a body, <laughs> like those kinds of friends and, and colleagues, then um, I think that that's the time, you know, when, when you're just at that really vulnerable point, you know, turn to somebody who gets you. Mm -hmm. and. And that's the kind of feedback, the kind of people that you need to be, uh, you know, have at least one person that you can call on like that. Yeah, having that ally is super critical. You know, well, I, I am so appreciative of you, um, speaking of allies and friends you can count on, jumping in and, and sharing some of your insights. I know you have um, so much knowledge on this topic and um, just putting yourself out there and, and being willing to uh, tackle the, the online and in-person uh, kind of things. Um, is there Are there any closing thoughts that you would have before we end this and wrap this up? Um, avoid perfectionism. That's a big thing. Um, be willing to... Oh, gosh, what is it? I, I interview on my podcast, I interview a lot of startups, so people that are creating businesses. And what comes back as a constant theme from the people that are, um, I want to say financially the most successful and emotionally the most successful. So I interviewed a guy that's, they're going to exit their company for a couple hundred million dollars. Like, wow. by all means, like, I've, that's a totally different business game than I've ever been in. And... I feel super inadequate of like thinking about things like that. And I'm asking him questions and he says, you know, honestly, you know, I, I go back to like, what would you have done differently at the beginning? And he said, I would have gotten feedback a lot sooner. Like I wouldn't have 
lived it up to me thinking this is great and this is like the perfect idea and I have to keep it to myself. He's like, I would have shared so much more with everyone. I would have gotten feedback sooner because you could be Tiger Woods and tell people all the techniques that you use to become the best golfer and all the strategies, but they're still not Tiger Woods. They're, they still haven't put in the work to do it, so it doesn't matter what information you share because more than likely people aren't going to take the action or they have to put in the work to receive the benefits of the action. So he said feedback. Feedback's a huge thing. Um, and then second is avoid being perfect. He's like, I would have launched my products so much sooner. And, and to the point where I would have launched my first product and projects where I would have almost be embarrassed. Like, ugh, like the graphics on this look awful or the video quality on this is awful or there's a bug here. It's like, but by doing that, you get it out there and you get feedback. And it's kind of like your first ebook cover. You know, um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not, you know, like making fun, but like <laughs> it, like you could have spent 10 hours or a hundred dollars to, you know, hire someone to do it or so much time. Hopefully that didn't take you 10 hours, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know what I mean? You could have spent all that time or you could say, you know what? Like I have to have a cover cause I got to get this book out. I'm going to do it. And volume two, I can change it if I choose. And honestly, like many times, it, volume one is good enough, or we iterate and we make little small changes over time, but we iterate into a different direction where things that, when you strive for perfection, things that don't really matter are things that, like, you get tunnel vision think it, thinking that they do matter. Like, I made people that, they think, like, oh, my gosh, the, my cover image is so important for my book and I can't do anything until that's perfect and it's like like that's such a small piece to the puzzle like who can like make it as good as you can and go and if you have a video and you say you know what like my constraint is I have to do a video a week and by Friday at noon it has to be out and if I don't do it Friday at noon like at 11 o'clock I have to hit record and talk in the camera and like get it out there. Is it, you know what I mean? So it's just right. immediate feedback, put limitations, and um, don't be imperfect. I, I love that. I am, I'm a huge proponent of eliminate perfectionism. And um, in backyard farming, I say I'm, I'm not a perfectionist anymore. I'm a get it doneist. Yeah. <laughs> because you just, you know, I think that's one of the things looking at me in college. Um, when I was not healthy and I was insane and I, I, took, I said yes to everything, I took on way too much and I completely, literally burned out, like burned and crashed. My body was so sick by the time I finally quit. Um, and now with five kids, I, I can't afford to go into that kind of unhealthy tailspin again. So I have to get to the point where I work fast, I work hard, I do good work, but it's not perfect. Yeah. It's done. And that's that's the point, you know. I, it's as good as I can make it, as efficiently as I can make it, and, um, you know, the the extra time and energy and money investment to make it perfect is not worth it to me anymore. I, no, that's I, not. I can't do it. And and um, you can, you know, version two, hire someone to make it perfect, or <laughs> you you know you have, um, you have the perspective of what really matters. Right. You know, I, the first ebook that I did um, a professional cover and editing design with was my Making Money Blogging. And I sold pre advanced copies because I didn't have the cash flow income at the time to just hire a graphic designer and hire an editor and pay them outright. So I pre sold copies of the book to earn enough money to pay the editor <laughs> for her work. And, um, you know, that, that book added, I, I talk about it, of course, that book added five figures to my family's income that year. So it was totally worth it to me to trade some personal consultation time. I didn't discount the book. I um, gave away a bonus upsell with the purchase of the book so that I was giving more value without discounting. And that worked so, so well for me. And, you know, I, I think that 
even if you're starting out from a place where you know you don't have the resources to make it perfect, you can be really creative with your solutions if you just oh. think think a little bit outside the box and put yourself out there and um, ask questions to see what's important to people and just go from there. Yeah, I think I think that's really good advice. It's it's, it's all up here. We can choose to to let it paralyze us or just let it get out there. All right. Well, I appreciate your time so much. Um, I think we're definitely past an hour now. So you have given us so much of your time, and um, I'm going to make sure that we link to you in the lessons and to the resources that you've mentioned. And thank you so much for coming. Thanks. It's my pleasure. All right. Take care. Bye.